Thank you, Midian. Anybody uh, know the name of that last song that he played in the melody? Gentle Shepherd, exactly. I remember listening to a cassette tape of the Heritage Singers while I was driving across the United States back in the 1970s or 80s. And hearing that song uh, kind of brought that back. And it's I, I really appreciate that because it's right on the topic we want to look at today. We want to focus today on perhaps the best known and most loved chapter in the Bible. And, you know, maybe you could debate that a little bit, but it's certainly up at the top in the top five or ten. This psalm, Psalm 23, has been recited at gravesides, been prayed at, in foxholes, called on in times of national as well as personal crises, brought to mind when no other scripture can be remembered. Its words have inspired and been included in thousands of songs and renditions, uh, all the way from Bach to Leonard Bernstein, Bob Dylan, Duke Ellington, and Franz Liszt. <laughs> I've uh, recently listened to adaptations of Psalm 23 performed by C.C. Winans, the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, Keith Green. I don't know if any of you know who Keith Green was. Never mind, I'll tell you about it some other time. But he was a very powerful uh, uh, Christian singer back in the late 1970s and early 80s. Uh, and the Vallejo Drive Chancel Choir, <laughs> um, which kind of brings me to a little aside. Um, it's been almost a year since I was with you folks last. I, I got a chance to, to uh, join you uh, last year. And in that time, I've been uh, driving past your location here several times a week because I have been working at Vallejo Drive Church uh, for most of the time as interim pastor and then recently helping in the transition with the new pastor, Jonathan Henderson. So I've become a lot more familiar with this part of uh, Southern California and I'm just so happy to be back here with you today. No matter what religious persuasion someone is or if they have no religion at all, most people know something about Psalm 23, right? With all the setbacks and the losses, with all the bad news and the death that we've experienced in the last, uh, last few years. And, you know, we've, we've all gone through a lot of stuff uh, because of the pandemic and because of the, the seismic shifts in, in the uh, uh, cultural and social and political uh, landscape around us. With all that stuff that has happened, I think we need to be reminded that our shepherd uh, cares for us as his sheep. As our scripture said, uh, uh, it was read earlier, John 10, 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my own sheep know me. I am the good shepherd. And I believe that he was referring directly to Psalm 23. He knew his, his Bible was the Old Testament, right? So, uh, so he says, I'm the good shepherd. Uh, and in this psalm, we see a compassionate, intelligent, persistent, consistent leader and guide. It refers to the Father God who Jesus came to reveal to us. And it refers prophetically to Jesus himself. And here, 3,000 years after David wrote these words, we still feel and we still treasure their impact. But what does it actually mean for Christ to be our shepherd? How are we to understand our relationship in the light of his words and in the light of this psalm? I believe Psalm 23 is a description of what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Christ. It's not just a plaque on the wall, you know? It's not just a, uh, a reference on a bumper sticker or some, some off-the-wall uh, 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 allusion in a lyric by Pink Floyd or U2, who both have drawn from Psalm 23 in some of their songs. Um, it's not just a saying, a religious saying. It's how we see and respond to the Master's leading in our lives and how the Master cares for and leads us as his followers, his flock. 
So I want to talk about, uh, and just go through the psalm. Because as I, as I prepared for this, um, I, I realized that I have passed over it so many times. I know it so well that I don't really know it, you know. And so in this psalm, you can break it into four sections, or at least that's what I'm going to do today. So we're going to talk about four things that, that this psalm describes God as. It describes the character of Christ as it relates to us. First of all, the good shepherd is my provider, is my provider. Verses one to three says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. He's our provider. So it says, it says, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. This psalm is all about the shepherd. So many times we, we read it and we, we read it with what it can bring to us. And that's a good thing. But what we have to really understand is what, what does this say about God, about who he is, about how he relates to us and how he treats us? David knew about the shepherds about shepherds, because he was one, right? He also knew that there were shepherds who put in their time, but they cared nothing for the sheep. It was just a job. It was just an income. Now, I think there's probably one or two people here that speak Spanish. Does anybody know the first line of, of Psalm 23 in Spanish? Okay. Mi pastor. And what does the word pastor mean? Or pastor mean? What is that? What does that word actually mean? It means shepherd. So we could go the other way, you know. Uh, I have the role of being a pastor. So in a sense, I'm I'm one of God's shepherds. I, I'm supposed to shepherd the flock. Jesus said to Peter uh, before he ascended back to heaven, Peter was uh on the, on the shore of the lake one Sunday morning, I think it was Sunday morning, and they were having a fish fry. Jesus was anyway. He was fixing fish for them, called them all in from the boat, and he, he talks to Peter, who had, uh, was fresh off of uh, a, a, a huge failure in his life in relationship to Christ. And Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you. You know the story, how he says it three times. And, and each time Peter gets more in fact, emphatic. And Jesus, in every response to what Peter says, I love you, Lord, he says, then feed my sheep, pastor my flock, take care of the people that I put under your care. Help them develop into devoted followers. We as pastors need to to remember that uh, we're here representing Christ, not here just to draw a paycheck, not here just to take up time and space. But the focus of this chapter is, is that the shepherd is good. This is a good shepherd. There were plenty of bad shepherds in, in David's day and in Jesus' day as well. But this shepherd is good. He cares about the sheep. He feeds them, waters them, protects the sheep. And the sheep are symbolic of you and me. We're the sheep. Anybody know anything about sheep? Anybody ever have to tend sheep? <laughs> I lived in Ireland for a, a, a little while, and uh, I was pastoring a church, a couple of churches there. And I had a friend who was also a pastor who lived on the West Coast. I was... Uh, um, I was on the East Coast in Dublin, and he was on, in the West Coast in Galway. And uh, he had a daughter, and her name was Mary. And Mary had a lamb. The lamb wasn't real little. It was when I, when I went to visit one time, uh, my wife and I went to visit one time, the lamb was, you know, kind of growing up, and the lamb was anything but stable. I mean, Mary would walk around the the grassy lawn kind of overlooking the ocean and uh, the sheep would just bounce around all over the place. 
and was crazy. Sheep are crazy. <laughs> and so uh, uh, I learned just from that experience that sheep are anything but just mellow, passive creatures. They're, they're, they're all over the map. They'll go any direction. They don't have a sense of direction. They will get lost if they're left to themselves. They're completely dependent on the shepherd for their well-being and survival. And they're dependent on the shepherd for their direction. That's one quality about a flock is most of the time the sheep will follow if they have the right instruction and the right shepherd. It says in, in these first three verses, I have all that I need. Uh, he provides everything that I need, the shepherd does. The psalm doesn't say, by following the good shepherd, I have everything I want, right? In fact, the King James Version puts it this way, I shall not want. I will want for nothing. <laughs> it means I have no lack. God provides everything for me that he sees is for my good. We all have needs. Every one of us. So what do you need? What are the things that you perceive in your life and in your mind that you need the most? What drives you? Uh, some of you are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and I'm not going to go into that today, but it's kind of an interesting pyramid. And, and, and the first, one of the first needs is for, is for uh, water and food, you know, our basic, the basic fundamental needs. So we, we, uh, we are driven by hunger, we're driven by thirst. Uh, we're driven by survival, but we're also driven by ambition and by desire. We do need food and we need fulfillment and we need safety and purpose and accomplishment, but our busy efforts to fill those cravings and feelings of deprivation will only leave us exhausted, parched, hungry, stressed and ultimately lost when the pursuits become ends in themselves. When that's all we think about, when we're so worried about whether or not we're going to have enough food to eat, whether we're going to have the right clothes to wear, have a roof over our heads. He, Psalm 23 says, the shepherd gives us what we need. You can trust him. You can believe in him. It also says he leads me. He provides direction. The sheep under the care of the shepherd are being led. They're going somewhere. And a good question that I ask myself when I read this chapter is, where are you going? What are you doing? Sometimes my wife asks me that. What are you doing? Sometimes I ask my dogs, what are you doing? You know, they just seem to have no sense of, of, uh, of purpose or anything. Is Jesus leading you, or are you just out on your own, trying to drag Jesus along with you? Are you actually following him? We have, sheep have, and we as spiritual sheep have one duty, one duty, to follow the shepherd, to follow the shepherd. But it's hard to do, isn't it? Because... Uh, we, like sheep, as the old hymn says, we're prone to wander. Prone to wander. We follow all right. <laughs> we follow our inclinations. We follow our instincts, our desires. We follow opportunities. Oh, look, there's an opportunity. I'm going to run after that. We don't stop to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, where do you want me to go? Is this the way that you would have me go? Just bring Christ into the conversation. That would be a good start. That would be a good start. We follow the guy in front of us. We're excited about the journey when it's really the destination that counts. The journey is good as long as we're following Jesus Christ. And maybe you think, well, that's not me. I have plenty of direction. I know where I'm going and I know how to get there. Well, maybe, but when you get there, what? You know, um, we're kind of raised in this country and in this culture. We, uh, we, we get old enough, we start going to school. We go to grade school and we go to high school and we, we look forward to graduation. Some of you have been through some graduations recently. This is graduation time of year. 
And uh, I went through one recently at Loma Linda Academy, our granddaughter and her cousin were graduating and it was just quite a party, but it was a graduation and then what? Well, then it's on to college and on to a career and on to maybe getting married and then you get married and you have kids and the kids grow up and you have a home and you maybe move a few times in this society, a lot of people move a lot of times. And you can just go through the entire cycle of, of a human being's experience and you realize without Christ, without God, without his purpose and his direction, our lives are just like one gigantic cycle. We go from the cradle to the grave. I lived in, uh, in Florida uh, for a time and it was interesting there they had... Uh, uh, in the Adventist community. It was in Forest Lake. Some of you maybe have been to Forest Lake Academy or Forest Lake Church. They had a grade school. They had a hospital. They had a grade school. They had a, a high school. They had a church. They had uh, a, an Adventist health food store. <laughs> you know, They had it all right there. They had, had the bank, and then they had the cemetery. Oh, I forgot the retirement home. It was all there. You could live your whole life right there. And that's fine, but what, what are you doing with your life? Where are you at? What are you, what are you doing? Or maybe the question is, what is God doing in your life and through your life and with you? If we follow, uh, if we just follow other people and we don't have the direction of Christ, we're like lemmings following each other off a cliff. But if we follow Jesus, we can trust he will lead us in right, safe, and purposeful pathways. And then it says, he renews my strength. He renews my strength. He restores my soul. I don't know how many miles I've driven in the past 10 months on the, on the 210, but it's been a lot back and forth. And if there's anything that it's not, it's, uh, it's peaceful, you know, it's not peaceful, it's not calming, it's not restoration, it's frenetic and crazy, and there's always some idiots, excuse me, there's always some people who want to drive 100 miles when everybody else is going 60 or 65, 100 miles an hour. This psalm says God provides restoration. He knows about the stress of living in this world. The endless traffic, the incessant voices of family and job, of ambitions and advertisers that demand our attention. He knows about our guilt from our failures and our troubles. He knows that we are just worn out many times. But if we let him, he'll lead us to places of rest and renewal. He restores my soul. When was the last time you let God lead you literally to a green meadow or to a mountain stream? We're kind of on the, the flanks here of uh, not the Sierra Madres, although this is Sierra Madre, but, uh, you know, um, the San Gabriel Mountains. Maybe there's a place you can go close by or maybe over to the ocean. When was the last time you just went and sat for a while? When you let the sounds of nature, the water sounds, the fresh mountain air, bring a bit of sanity back into your soul. This afternoon or tomorrow morning, maybe try to get to a quiet place and listen to your shepherd speak to you. Speak to you as you converse with him. That's called prayer, you know, talking to God as a friend. Speak to you through his word, let him feed you and restore you and bring some sanity back to your soul. Then it says, the good shepherd is my protector, my protector. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and staff protect and comfort me. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and staff protect and comfort me. 
You ever get afraid? Anybody here today, have you, have you had pangs of fear this past week? Anybody? There's one right there. Well, there's somebody who's honest, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I get afraid all kinds, all, all, all the time, different ways. And, and a lot of times I don't even realize I'm afraid. I'm just concerned. I'm concerned. I'm worried. I don't know if this is going to work out. But that's all fear, right? I'm afraid I won't have enough money to cover my bills. I'm afraid that, that uh, my wife maybe uh, not get the right medical care or that I might not get the right medical care. I'm afraid that I won't be able to see my children. So the, all these fears, they weigh on us. It says the, the good shepherd is my protector. He, it says I will not be afraid when I walk even through dark valleys. He's with me no matter how dark it gets. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Your rod and your staff. And, and did you notice that in the psalm at this point, David goes from talking about God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me. He feeds me. He has me laid down. Now he talks to God. Why is it that we get more personal with God when we're in trouble? It's easy to stand up and preach a sermon or give a Sabbath school lesson or something. When things are going okay, we can talk about God to other people. But when we get in great distress, when we get in great fear, like flying on an airplane in the middle of a thunderstorm, some of you have probably experienced that before. When we are in trouble, that's when we seem to really reach out to God personally. It's not anymore a, 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 theor, a, a theoretical theology. It's real. It's personal. It's one thing to say the Lord is good. It's another thing, quite another thing to say, God help me. <laughs> God help me. The Bible says that, that when we cry out to God and ask for his help, when we cry out to God and ask for his mercy, that he hears us. It's not usually in the meadows of life that we have the best and closest communion with God. The green pastures that Psalm 23 talks about and the still waters actually can be at times more dangerous than walking through dark valleys of the shadow of death. You know why? Because when everything's going good, what happens to us? We get kind of complacent, don't we? get kind of self-satisfied. And we are prone to forget that the good shepherd is the very reason we have good grazing in the first place. He's the one that brings all the good into our lives. On the way to finding green pastures, God often leads us through places where there's lots of cliffs and dark canyons. And as, long, as much as we long for everything to be beautiful and wonderful and perfect, the fact is that life in this world is contaminated by all kinds of evil and decay and trouble. It's just the way it is here presently. And God, isn't, God, God is not saying, I'm giving you a magic key to, to eliminate all those troubles. He's saying, I am the key. I'm the one who will walk beside you, who will lead you through those dark paths of your life. You know, you, this can relate to some of, the, some of us who are older. You, you get the mortgage paid off and then find out you have cancer. You celebrate your daughter's high school, school graduation and she tells you she's pregnant and she's not married. You're having a good time and then something triggers some old emotional pain or some relational pain that, that keeps sabotaging your life. But David sings in this psalm, Psalm 23, God, you are with me through it all. You are the good shepherd. No matter what happens in my life, no matter how it looks like everything's going to fall apart, God is with me. God is with you. It's, God, it's, it's bad to go through crises and pain, and we all will experience. If you haven't yet, you will. It's just part of the world. But it's much worse to go through those things alone. 
And the promise here is, you are not alone. I am with you all the way, God says. The good shepherd is my protector. He protects me from evil itself. It's not so much just the effects. He protects me from being broken and ruined by the evil. And he protects us through discipline. Some people think that's a bad word. They think of punishment, but discipline is not punishment. Think of the root word of discipline. What is the root word of discipline? It's disciple. It's God's training for for keeping us close to him. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Would you really stay close to God if you won the lottery? Have you ever asked yourself that? I wish I could win even a million, even the million. That's a little one, right? It's not, it's not a billion. It's just a million. Yeah, would you really stay close to God, Terry, if you won the lottery? Would you be thinking of his will and his word if your life had uh, endless good times, lots of money, and all kinds of great friends? Really, the greatest evil that we have to fear is the evil that has gotten its way into our own souls. And we rarely face the truth. We rarely face the truth about what's going on inside of us when everything is going just the way we want it. God doesn't bring trouble and pain and disappointment to us, but he certainly has an amazing ability to use it for our benefit, doesn't he? He uses disappointments and trouble to remind us that we need him to keep us on the path and protect us from the evil that lurks in our own souls. You're with me even through the dark valleys. You protect us. And then finally, the good shepherd. The good shepherd is my patron, my benefactor. He is my patron and my benefactor. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Here we go. Patron. I want you to think about that word. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Now, some of you might have read a little book called uh, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, and it was written by uh, a, a man who, who literally was a, had a lifetime uh, occupation of being a shepherd, I think, in South Africa, first of all. And uh, just amazing things he draws out of this, this psalm. And there's so much in here. I don't have time uh, to go into all the specifics, like uh, about the anointing, how, the, how they use oil for sheep. They use it to, to heal, but also to keep the flies away. My, my girls are in the horse business, and they have uh, solutions and things that they put on their horses to do the same kind of thing. But, but basically, he's saying the good shepherd does everything, not only provides for my needs, but he blesses me over and beyond what I really need. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. We do have enemies, yeah? And our enemy, number one, is the devil who seeks to ruin our lives. When someone hurts you, do you ever, do you ever want revenge? You ever want them to hurt back, to know how bad they hurt you? The only way they can know how bad they hurt you is to feel the pain themselves. Maybe it would be nice, but when I follow God as my shepherd, instead of seeking revenge, I get to experience how God gives me justice. Maybe it doesn't come in this lifetime, but God will always bring what's right and bring what's just. He will... He will at some point in history, set everything right that's been wrong. Everything. He gives me justice. He sees and knows when you've been insulted or hurt or betrayed. And since he's your shepherd, he's also your advocate. God is for you. He's not against you. The world may be against you, but God will bless you. He'll bring justice and blessing, a feast. Who doesn't like a feast? 
you're going to have a potluck here next weekend, right? I love potlucks, especially when they have haystacks, you know. <laughs> a feast. God just pours it on. And, and, and I, when I read this, I often think of, of the day when we're go going to all sit around this, I don't know, the table. How can you accommodate eight or ten billion people at a table? But somehow, some way, God's going to be with us all at a, just a grand feast. We are going to stuff ourselves but we'll be we'll be temperate because we're in heaven, of course, right? But uh, we're gonna we're just gonna have the best time eating and sharing and talking and crying and praising and just thanking God for what He's done. I love sitting down at a table with friends and just spending a, a, an afternoon or a day in fellowship. God is for you. And he's for you in front of those who are against you, primarily the devil and all of, all of his evil angels. The songs, song says he's going to set you up as his chosen one in front of those who would, who would have wished evil and worked evil in your life. His specially favored child. To know and follow God as my shepherd, mean, shepherd means I will, my life will overflow with his goodness. God's grace, the spring of living water that Jesus talks about flowing out of our hearts. See, when, when we open our hearts to Christ, when we, when we say those words, Lord, I will follow you, he says he'll put into us a spring of water that will, will spring up to bless other people. We won't always be looking for how we can get our needs met, for how we can fix our problems, for how we can, can have our hurts and hangups and and troubles, uh, you know, ministered to by others, will be so full of God's grace that we'll be able to give to them. That's really the secret of ministry, actually. So many people minister out of, out of obligation or somebody else's expectation, and that's not the way God designed it. He designed us to, to first be filled by him so that then when, when he presents the opportunity for us to give, we give freely because we're so full we can't hold it all in, right? <laughs> to know and follow God as my shepherd means I will overflow with his goodness. I will overflow with his goodness. God's grace, God's grace to me and to you. You prepare a feast for me, it says. You honor me. My cup overflows with blessings. The good shepherd is my patron. I, I use that word. What's a patron? Well, here's a definition. It's someone who encourages or helps a person, a cause, or a work. Someone under whose protection another person places herself or himself. So you have someone who, who has a lot of uh, resources who's watching out for you. That's a patron. Someone who supports or champions something or someone. My shepherd is not only interested in my welfare, he wants me to flourish. He wants you to just be the best. He wants you to flourish. He wants to give me every good thing, every advantage, every lavish gift possible. This song, which Psalm 23 is, it starts in the green pastures and serene streams and ends in the abundant party of the Lord's household. But it also passes through the dark valley. Following the shepherd is not easy. Following Jesus is not easy. It's not a life of ease and not a life of, of uh, uh, no pain or trouble. But it is a life that is always good, always good, because he is always good. Amen? Amen. He's the one who honors and blesses me so abundantly. Finally, Psalm 23 says, the good shepherd. Oops, wrong way. The good shepherd is my pursuer. And this is the part that really, really makes me love God so much. Makes me love Jesus Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me 
all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me. <laughs> He's my pursuer. He comes after me if I wander. He looks for me when I am lost to bless me with goodness and mercy. God's goodness and unfailing love. We, we have to understand these descriptions of God. They don't exist apart from God. When, you, when it says his goodness and his unfailing love, it's talking about God himself, right? So it isn't some... It isn't some package God sends after us. It's not some drone he sends to follow us around. No, he comes after us. His Holy Spirit is constantly pursuing us to draw us back to him. No matter where you find yourself today, no matter what failures you may have experienced or what hurts you have, no matter how dark it may be, God is drawing you back to himself constantly, fervently. He's our pursuer. God himself is seeking me. He doesn't wait for me to get on the right path. He doesn't wait for me to get on the right path. You can trust God in every single part of your life. It doesn't matter what you've done or what you haven't done. It doesn't matter. You can trust that God is on your side. He's for you, not against you. He's seeking you. He's pursuing you. He wants to provide everything that you need. Amen. And the question is, are you going to listen to his call? Are you going to let him speak to you? Are you going to respond by saying, Lord, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to put my trust in you. I want to share a song with you here uh, at the end. This is not Psalm 23. This is my own song. A few years ago, uh, I found myself in, in ministry going through a very, very difficult time. There was uh, some people in my church that were had set themselves against not just me, but against the direction our church was taking. You guys probably never have had any, you know, church trouble or drama, right? But <laughs> I did, and uh, and I would find myself just stressing over it and complaining about it, and and. Uh, just endlessly trying to figure out how to overcome it and fix it. And God finally, through a number of different ways, reminded me this wasn't my battle. This was his. And that no matter what was happening in my life, I could trust in him. So um, one, one day I just wrote these words in this tune down. I put my trust in you, O oh, Holy Lord, embracing your purposes and plans. I give you all my fears, you are my comfort, Lord. My troubles I place in your hands, and I will never be disappointed in your promises, for you are the strength that I need. And all my anxious thoughts melt away in your presence, Jesus, resting in your care, I find peace. I 
I put my trust in you, O oh, Holy Lord, embracing your purposes and plans, not my own, Lord. I give you all, all my fears, for you are my comfort, Lord. My troubles I place in your hands, and I will never be disappointed in your promises, for you are the strength that I need. And all my anxious thoughts melt away in your presence, Jesus, resting in your care. I find peace, and all my anxious thoughts melt away in your presence. Jesus, resting in your care, I find peace. Resting in your care, I find peace. As long as you live, God will pursue you. Left to ourselves, we could, never, uh, we could never stay with God on our own. If you haven't figured that out, you will. <laughs> but God's patient, and he loves you more than you can ever possibly imagine. But we're not on our own, are we? He watches. He waits. He runs to find us in our broken places. So today... Will you put your trust in him? In everything, all the time. If you do, if you do, and if I do, then when you draw the first breath in your new and perfect resurrection body, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of getting old, and I'd like, I, I'd like one of those, Lord, <laughs> send, it, send it my way. And he's promised we're going to get a brand new body. And when you draw your first breath in that new resurrection body, you will do so with the delight of knowing that you are home for good in our Father's house, never to leave or face another dark valley, always forever to live in the house of our Lord, our Lord who is our pursuer, who is our patron, who is our, who is our protector, who is our provider. He is my friend and he is yours. He is, he is the good shepherd of our souls. to stand with me for the benediction.
Lord, you know, you know all of us here today, everything that we need, everything that we are, the good things, the bad things, the, the challenges that we face. You know this church, this part of your great worldwide church. And Lord, your hand is over it. And I pray that, that you will bless Community Adventist Fellowship, that you will make them a, a, a significant uh, power for good in this community, that through the fellowship that they have with each other and with Jesus, that others would see how good, how loving, how full of grace and mercy that you are. And as we leave this place, Father, I pray that you will give us a sense of your presence, uh, of the, the truth and the reality of Jesus, that he is alive, that he has every intention of bringing us back home with him. We pray all of this in his name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.